Anyways, in late summer in 2019, I'd say maybe a couple miles away from Montello, I was walking down in the woods in Marquette County, Wisconsin. I decided to go in the night after dark because there would be no heat, and I didn't want to get heat stroke out there. I was taking a walk on a foot trail some people used and made, but it's not an actual trail on any maps. Anyways, moments before the experience happened, I checked my phone and it was 1.42 a.m. Couple minutes later, I hear a, hey, bro, can you help me from a direction I was facing? I said, with what? They said, come closer, which made me choose to run back down the way I came. And yes, I got chased down and heard, I need some help, bro. Funny enough, a deputy was driving by as I floored it out of there as the dude hit my car with a knife, scratched my truck a bit, and dented it. This happened in September. No, the deputy did not do anything, as I don't think they really cared. About 12 years ago, I was camping at Clear Creek Campground near Mount Hood, Oregon. It was in the middle of the night when Bigfoot entered our camp. We quickly shone our flashlights on the creature. Interestingly, it seemed to have a short fuse as it threw a tantrum uprooting small trees and hurling them across the creek while emitting a low to high-pitched scream. We could barely catch a glimpse of it even with the lights, as it stood about 100 yards away, according to my account. There were six witnesses, and we estimated its height at eight feet. The following day, we decided to track the creature for about a mile. The tracks eventually disappeared on a rocky shelf that it had climbed. The human-shaped footprints we found were a staggering 17 inches long. We also discovered tracks in a nearby clear cut at McSoven's Gulch, which was full of thistles, making it an unlikely place for a barefoot hoaxer. Additionally, I shared that my oldest brother had his own encounter with Bigfoot as he saw it running across the Barlow Road near Pine Grove on the east slope of the Cascades. I'll never forget the day I stumbled upon a curious story hidden within the faded pages of a 1980 issue of the St. Helens Chronicle newspaper. The informant's whisper had led me to a report, a mysterious encounter one mile south of Gobble, Oregon, along Highway 30 near Rainier. According to the account, an elusive creature had left its mark in a dense salmonberry patch, the bushes stripped bare of their succulent berries. As I ventured into the heart of this story, I couldn't help but imagine the creature's presence, its dark head navigating through the thicket. The trail didn't end there. The creature had encountered a barbed wire fence. It left behind a piece of evidence, a tuft of ten inch long, light brown hair caught in the unforgiving grip of the wire. The texture was unlike anything familiar. It was coarse, reminiscent of fish line. My mind raced with questions as I envisioned the creature, a mysterious figure with a head crowned in darkness, casually strolling over the fence as if boundaries meant nothing. As I delved deeper into the accounts and collected fragments of the past, the enigma surrounding this elusive being grew. What creature could leave such a peculiar trail, stripping berries with an almost calculated precision and traversing obstacles with an otherworldly ease. The newspaper article might have faded with time, but the echoes of that encounter lingered, urging me to uncover the secrets hidden within the heart of the Oregon wilderness. This incident occurred in early 1980 near Arago, approximately five, seven miles from Lampa Mountain. At that time, I had a paper route and was delivering newspapers from my truck to the residents of that area. It has been so long ago that I don't remember the road name, but it was around 3.30, and it was lightly raining when I came around a sharp corner in the road. I saw the back of a large animal quickly crossing the roadway and climbing the side of the road cut. 
The road cut was covered with grass about two feet high and was approximately 10 feet high, probably at a 70 degree angle. As large bears are common in this area due to the sheep population, I initially assumed it was a reddish brown colored bear I was driving by. The animal must have been at least six feet long and had very long hair along its spine. I remember very clearly the part in the hair along the spine, thanks to the wet weather. I passed within 15 feet of the animal as it climbed very quickly to the top of the road cut and out of sight. What always struck me as odd is that the animal's spine did not flex like that of a bear when it was moving, and its rear legs were not directly under it, but more out to its sides as it climbed out of sight. It also had very large, broad shoulders. The animal climbed hand over hand to the top of the road cut in about three seconds. I tightened my grip on my M16 rifle as we cautiously made our way through the dense, treacherous terrain of the remote island stronghold in Montenegro. Leading our highly trained U.S. Special Forces team was Jack, a seasoned veteran with nerves of steel and an unwavering determination. Our mission was critical. Infiltrate the stronghold controlled by a dangerous Russian terrorist organization, rescue a high-profile Ukrainian hostage, and prevent a catastrophic attack on NATO soil. The stakes couldn't have been higher, and every step we took brought us closer to danger. As we bypassed heavily armed guards and circumvented intricate security systems, the tension in the air was palpable. The adrenaline coursed through my veins, keeping me alert and focused on the task at hand. We were a well-oiled machine, moving swiftly and silently as we approached our target. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we reached the heart of the stronghold. The room where the hostage was held captive was heavily guarded, but our training and precision allowed us to neutralize the threat swiftly and without raising the alarm. With our Ukrainian hostage safe, we set explosives to destroy the stronghold and eliminate any trace of the terrorist organization's operations. With the countdown ticking down, we made our way to a pre-designated rendezvous point deep within the woods. Fatigue weighed on our bodies, but our determination pushed us forward. Little did we know that an unexpected encounter awaited us. As we reached the rendezvous point, we caught sight of a creature unlike anything we had ever encountered before. It stood an imposing nine feet tall, with shoulders as wide as four feet. Its stringy hair offered glimpses of the immense muscles that flexed beneath its taut skin. Its thighs were as round as tree trunks, and its lack of a discernible neck accentuated its cone-shaped head. With long arms that swung with unnerving grace, I struggled to find the words to describe this hybrid creature, a terrifying amalgamation of half-gorilla and half-neanderthal man. Fear and astonishment gripped us as the creature locked its gaze on our team. With a sudden burst of speed, it charged towards us, driven by an unknown purpose. We unleashed a volley of rounds from our M16 rifles, aiming to subdue the beast, but our bullets seemed to have little effect. The creature endured the barrage, shrugging off the impacts as it closed in on us. Time seemed to slow as panic mixed with determination in our eyes. We fought with all our might, engaging in a desperate struggle to survive. But just as it seemed our fate was sealed, the creature abruptly turned and fled into the shadows of the surrounding forest. Its eerie, guttural growls echoed in the distance, leaving us bewildered and awestruck. Relief washed over us as the thumping sound of helicopter blades grew louder in the distance. Our extraction had arrived. As we boarded the helicopter and rose into the air, the question lingered in our minds. What kind of creature had we encountered? I was patrolling in my cruiser when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. 
It looked like a man-sized lizard walking on two legs, crossing up ahead. It had shiny scales all over it, and it moved very quickly, like it was very comfortable walking on two legs without a problem. Its eyes were this fiery red color. It turned over to look at me, so I did a U-turn for it as soon as it disappeared, thinking this was just some freaking Halloween costume. I drove around aimlessly, checking every road and nook and cranny on the path before going off about where this thing had been seen. About an hour after that, just outside of Colchester County, our cruiser got attacked by what we think was the same lizard creature, except now it came from behind and shattered the back glass. It nearly almost got into the cruiser had it not been knocked off the car and shot at. After this happened, the weird things began happening to all the officers who experienced this. Bad nightmares, strange paranormal happenings at home. Then it became the entire police station. Everybody felt like they were under attack by some kind of demon or devil. There were only so many details to remember about these things. They kind of reminded me of gremlins or ghostbusters, except they were so gross and reptilian looking. The only one who seemed to understand at the time was our second to the chief officer, Schieffer. He had had personal run-ins with these things before, individually and by himself while hunting. And then other strange paranormal happenings began happening all over the police station. Even worse, things got increasingly violent, and I began fearing for my life. Even now, I feel like whatever that thing was had attached evil spirits to me and my fellow colleagues. Do you have any idea at all? I know you're just a YouTube guy, but do you have any idea at all what this could be or if this means anything? I'm just an officer who's desperate looking for help. One of my buddies is a private pilot, and this is my favorite story of his. A friend of his had to fly a small jet filled with half a dozen or so caskets that did in fact contain deceased bodies. Some family issues came up so his friend asked if he could make the flight for him. No problem, it's a quick flight with decent pay, why not? Once he accepts, his friend warns him not to take the aircraft above 30,000 feet. He's a bit puzzled, but doesn't worry about it too much, and pretty soon he's in the air along with the least sociable passengers imaginable. Everything's going fine the first few hours, until he notices a heavy weather system building ahead of him. He keeps the same altitude of 30,000 feet for a while, but pretty soon the turbulence is just too much, so he says F it and hauls on up to 45,000 feet. No more turbulence, just smooth sailing at this point. A few minutes later, he starts hearing a strange noise coming from the back of the plane, a strange moaning sound almost, accompanied by the occasional bump. This is pretty sketchy because he's the only crew on the plane, and unless this is some World War Z shit, those passengers shouldn't be making any noise. But nevertheless, the strange moaning and bumps continue. He tries his best to ignore them until there is another bump, much louder than the rest, and a very intense moaning sound. He quickly looks back and sees one of the caskets is open with the person inside sitting almost completely upright. Well shit, this really is some World War Z mess. He just stares at the dead body moaning at him, and hopes to God the man was a vegan and wants some grains instead of his brains. The more the body moans though, the more it slinks back into the open coffin. Now the 30,000 feet ceiling makes sense, the remaining air in the lungs of the bodies expanded as the altitude increased until they couldn't hold it anymore and some began to leak out, in the form of the creepiest and least sexy moan possible. The one that sat upright expanded so much that his chest cavity actually became buoyant enough to partially lift his upper body. Once he realized this, he noped the F right down to 25,000 feet and never covered a flight for that friend again.
My nickname is Detective Mark Smith. I'm a civil servant working in the South Carolina State Park Service Police Department. Recently, while on patrol at Santee State Park, I encountered an individual who claims to be part of the Lizard Man Task Force. It was approximately midnight when dispatch had sent us to investigate reports of somebody screaming from inside the park. We immediately responded. As we neared the location where the screams were last heard, our vehicle malfunctioned, losing all power along with most electrical equipment. This forced us to continue on foot, following what appeared to be abandoned tire tracks leading into a heavily wooded area. The tracks seemed to belong to a mid-sized 4x4 or SUV-type vehicle. We continued on foot as the screams, sounding like a young child pleading for help from something unknown, grew closer. Suddenly, the screams ceased, replaced by the growling sound of an unknown creature. I caught a glimpse of yellow eyes staring at us before it swiftly ran into the night. It took about an hour to find another officer who arrived with a tow truck to pull our car back onto the road. We then contacted dispatch to have it towed away for repair. By now, it was 2.18 a.m., and we headed back to the station, feeling frustrated, tired, and somewhat scared. Upon our return, dispatch informed us of reports of another officer down, whom I'll call Officer James. Apparently, he had been attacked by a large, unknown animal. As we rushed to the scene, more screams were heard from a nearby neighborhood. People there were having their own encounters with this creature. We split into two teams, realizing the extreme aggression and danger this creature posed. Our equipment malfunctioned, causing delays in regrouping. Fortunately, all officers were physically unharmed, but shaken. They described an eight-foot-tall creature with glowing yellow eyes, resembling a giant walking lizard. When we fired at it, the creature growled in a demonic tone and disappeared into the woods. Realizing the abnormal nature of the situation, we knew we needed to reassess our approach. We discovered massive footprints near where Officer James had been attacked. He was seriously injured and had to wait for help to arrive. That night, we first heard about the beings linked to the Lizard Man sightings, which had occurred across the state over the years. After that night, the details become hazy in my memory. However, I found myself taking a friend into Santee State Park to show him something called the Ritual Site. He believed it was connected to the Lizard Men or some sort of cult. We ventured into the woods, reaching an area where the attacks had occurred near the ritual site. Suddenly, something large jumped out with the same height and glowing eyes. It attacked my friend and knocked me unconscious in the process. When I woke up, I searched for my friend for hours, but he was nowhere to be found. Desperate, I approached a park ranger and explained what had happened. He suggested seeking more police assistance at the Santee State Park Ranger Station as they were experiencing more encounters with this creature. When we arrived at the station, the sheriff explained that they had been receiving numerous sightings of the Lizard Man. It became evident that the creature was very, very real. Early 2000s, I was traveling a remote highway in eastern Nevada close to the Utah border when I saw some lights in the horizon. I assumed they were lights to some mine and thought nothing of it until I had gone another 20 miles and realized they were still there. I pulled over to a gas station and asked the lady if she knew what the lights were from. She does not answer me only turns off all the lights and then picks up the phone to call someone and tell them they're back. All of a sudden, various groups of people start showing up walking from either direction in the highway to congregate at the gas station and stare off silently toward the horizon. Where these people came from I have no idea because I had not noticed any houses. I simply made my way back to the car and discreetly went on my merry way, wondering what the F just happened.
Once I went out to go to a drive out in our 80 acre land. About half of that land is pure swamp land. The rest of it is fields and pasture. We were doing it on my grandfather's land since we own land, but it is only two fields. We go hunting on this land every year, but we have never done drives. When I usually go hunting, I went with my dad, since I was too young to go alone. But these last two years I have become old enough to where I can hunt alone. See, we went on our drive since we now had enough people. I instantly regretted saying yes when my dad asked me if I wanted to do a drive. We live next to an Indian tribe. They are civilized but are known for trespassing. That has nothing to do about the story, but that's why I instantly regretted it. So we went, I had my 223 caliber in my hands, I was alone, and in the middle of the swamp. It was winter, icy, and cold. As soon as I entered, I slipped. It hurt since my back landed on a log. I went on, though. A couple of minutes later, I hear a voice. It sounds like my dad's, but it sounded weird. I called him on the walkie-talkie, and he responded, talking very quiet. But I could still hear the voice. It was becoming louder. I continue on thinking that it's just my head playing games. Well, I was wrong. I walk forward a few feet and freeze. I saw someone or something because it sure wasn't human-like. It was very tall and slim, and as soon as I looked at it, it ran very fast. I ran the opposite way. Told them to get out of there, they did. I called them to regroup and told them what I saw and heard. I never went into the swamp again, but I still go hunting at the land and never saw it since. This gives me nightmares till this day, and that was two years ago. Could it be a Sasquatch? I am a photographer and I love shooting creepy old stuff in the middle of the night. In the middle of nowhere. I am always alone. One night I am at the old, deserted ruins of a fort in West Texas, working on a western series. The site covers many, many acres and is mostly just fallen walls and piles of rubble. The history of the place includes an Indian massacre, unmarked graves, and other assorted creepy factors. This in and of itself is nothing to me. As I said, I do this sort of thing often and never experience anything like I did that night. As I pulled into the site, I was immediately struck with a feeling of dread and doubt about the shoot. Just five minutes prior, I was full of excitement and vigor. I had been traveling for hours to reach this desolate place and was glad to be getting close. I shake off the feeling of dread and toss back a five-hour energy. I had been awake at this point for 20 hours. It was nearing midnight. I gathered my equipment, which consists of a compass, a tripod, camera, and a small light. Oh, also a 30-30 rifle. It's a western series with a few selfies. I begin walking into the footprint of the old fort. It is a warm night, but I am feeling uneasy. I have goosebumps and my short hairs are standing on end. This is an alien reaction for my normally cool demeanor. It is nothing for me to walk through a forest at night, flashlight or moonlight. Anyway, I find a spot I like and start to set up for a shot. I hear a noise. Not a big deal, I think. It's just an animal. Seconds later, I hear something that sounds like a whisper. It was muted, even for a whisper. There was nothing to make out. This time I dismiss it as an auditory hallucination which I know could be likely given the number of hours I have been awake. All this time my heart is pounding, and wave after wave of chills, doubt and dread are passing through me. Still, I have traveled for hours and I decide this is a test of my mettle, and I won't let fear get to me and ruin this shoot. Even though I had determination on my side, my hands were shaking, and I could not think clearly. The shots are difficult and require some camera setup, which I could not seem to get right. 
Normally, I see a shot and instinctively know where to set ISO, aperture, color temperature, etc. Fast forward three minutes, I get one crappy shot, maybe two. I take a deep breath and walk to another spot. I hear the whisper again, this time behind me. I turn quickly, light in hand, and there is nothing there. Gathering every ounce of willpower, I walk slowly to the next spot, whispers in tow. I stop, and I am shaking at this point. I set up for the shot. The whisper has turned to whispers, and they surround me. I am trying to play this off as tricks of the mind due to lack of sleep, but my self-pep talk is not working anymore. I reach to press the shutter button, a cacophony of whispers surrounding me, and it was then that I felt very clearly the weight of a hand on my shoulder. Needless to say, that was it for me. Shoot was over, and I made haste to my car and got the F out of there. I found a convenience store that glowed like a white beacon in the night 30 or 40 miles down the road. I had coffee and collected myself for half an hour. About an hour later, I was in an old cemetery, taking photos, and I was completely at ease. Was it fatigue? Maybe. But none of it carried over to the rest of the night. I won't go back to that fort alone again. My family has a summer house on a large remote island. Our place is in the most lightly inhabited part, and to get to it you either have to sail or fly, and then either hike over extremely steep terrain so steep that on the downhill side one has to hang onto trees and bracken and go hand over hand and half slide down for about three hours or travel for around 40 minutes in a little open topped boat at high tide. There are no roads or utilities. There are some other houses around, but they are far apart and one has to walk through thick bush on tiny narrow tracks for at least 10-15 minutes to get to a neighbor. There are no lights and while the stars and moon are very bright on a cloudy night, you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. It's incredibly remote and mostly incredibly idyllic. Long childhood summers running wild through the forest and playing in the streams. There are some incredibly creepy things about it though. Story 1. There is a grave at the entrance to the river. It's been there since the 1-800s and is a light colored stone with a white picket fence around it. The woman buried there was one of the original settlers of the area. When I was a child, the grave had fallen into disrepair. Strange things started happening all around the houses in the area. Doors slamming without a breeze, funny noises, taps turning on and off by themselves, little things going missing and weird problems with boat motors with no explanation. After a while, the community got sick of it, and someone suggested it had something to do with the grave. After laughing it off, everyone decided it wouldn't hurt to clean up the grave. They went out one day, weeded, scrubbed the stone, painted the fence, said a few words, and all the weird happenings stopped. Story 2. There are places that just feel wrong all over the area. There are no dangerous creatures on the island other than potentially wild pigs, and it's always the same places. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck to walk through them even in groups, and more than a few times I've sprinted dangerously on narrow, dangerous tracks when walking by myself at night, just because I'm freaked as hell by the sense of fear and dread. And I'm almost 30 and not at all afraid of the dark under normal circumstances. It's not just humans either. I got a new dog. I was walking along a track with him in the middle of the day in bright sunshine, and we were maybe one min from one of these creepy places. Suddenly he stopped dead and he tensed up, stared right down the trail at the creepy area and started growling and barking and backing away. He got to the point where he was pressed up against my legs, tail down. As I was reaching down to touch him, he let out a sound that was crossed between a scream and a bark, ran around me and dashed off back the way we'd come. I turned around and started sprinting too. 
I found him at the house cowering under a bench. Ever since, he's absolutely refused to even go to the start of that track. When I was maybe seven or eight, I spent the better part of a month at a cabin in the woods with my grandpa and my little cousin. This cabin was up from Fontana Lake in North Carolina. My papa grew up there and was on his way out, and I guess he just wanted to spend time with some of his grandkids and show us what his life was like before he passed. The trip was great, I had an absolute blast, but there was two bizarre events that I still can't fully wrap my head around. There was like a half a mile gravel road that stemmed from an awful one lane road that ended at a dirt trail, which lead to the front porch of the cabin. It was out of the way up in the woods and had no one near it. This cabin is or was small and smelled like mildew. It had a living room, kitchen and bedroom, no bathroom, everything was tiny. You had to either go outside or walk a few miles to the docks. Papa said he'd had problems with bobcats at night climbing around the cabin and yelling so if we heard something strange outside we shouldn't be alarmed. This of course alarmed us. A few nights into the stay around 1.30 a.m. me and my cousin were woken up by a knock on the door. We were asleep in the living room and my papa was in the bedroom. I wasn't about to answer the door and my cousin was freaking the hell out. We waited in paralyzed silence as the knocks continued and got louder until it was basically someone or something kicking the door. Not surprisingly, they didn't wake up my papa. The man's snores were house shaking lie loud and you'd basically have to slap him to get him up. Once the kicks started, the fear-induced paralysis wore off and turned into absolute panic. I bolted to the bedroom and shook my papa awoke. Upon hearing the banging at the door, he grabbed his revolver. He then went to the door and without saying anything, just shot a few rounds through the door and went back to bed. My cousin and I didn't sleep after that. The next day, my papa simply said, no one has any business being up here. The porch surprisingly was clean, but the dirt path, gravel driveway, and road were blood-soaked. The blood went across and down the road and ended near the docks. The police never came, and nothing was ever said about it again. I told my mom once after my papa had passed, and she wasn't shocked at all. She even said my papa and his brother shot a pedophile in Mississippi after he tried to prostitute some little girls to them while they were on a fishing trip. My papa was a hard-boiled, stubborn, God-fearing man, and I miss him, even if he did occasionally shoot people. Next up, during the second week, we took a pontoon boat to the dam. Near the shore of the right side of the dam was a dead snake half on land, half and half in the water, seriously 40 plus feet in length. It was easily longer than the boat and bloated. My papa said there was an abandoned zoo and it probably came from that and had just been living around the lake. Not so much mysterious or creepy, but definitely weird. When I was a kid 10-12, maybe there was this really old creepy house just round the corner from me. I lived in a fairly nice area and this house was just old and had stained net curtains and a cracked front door and all the works. The guy worked irregular shifts so nobody ever really saw him, but other kids would tell stories that they saw him coming home in the early hours with dead animals and bloody knives. Obviously, the rest of us laughed it off as BS. Anyway, one summer we were all bored and decided to sneak past the factories round the back of his house and onto a patch of grass to try to get a look through his back garden. To get there you had to sneak past these buildings, through a bunch of trees, and then through a mesh fence that we had to climb over. Not an accessible place at all, and no other way to get to it. Four of us made the trip and took turns to bunk each other up to get a look over the fence. 
I went last and could see my other friends were creeped the F out. There were two dead cats hanging from his tree by their tails with a bunch of dolls' heads tied up off the branches and swinging around in the breeze. I could just about see into the house and there were no lights on and a few candles lit in a circle on his floor. My friend swears he saw a limp human leg, foot in the doorway, but none of the rest of us did. Just as I got a good look, the gate opened and the guy came strolling out, casual as F, with a bloody machete in his hand. We ran, he chased. We all leaped over the mesh fence and then he was gone. Never saw him again. I still have no idea what he was up to and we never told anyone for fear of getting in trouble for what we did. Prior to joining the U.S. Navy, my grandfather took me aside and told me several stories of his time spent in the Navy during World War II. It was his way of ensuring I knew what I was getting into. My grandfather was a weapons technician 2WT2 aboard the destroyer USS Mori DD-401 from 1942-1945 and manned a 538 caliber cannon. He survived Pearl Harbor, Battle over Taroa, Battle of Midway, and the invasion of Luzon, to name a few, with only a small shrapnel wound to his leg in all that time. I'd like to share one of those stories of his, though, as it just blows my mind to this day. The Mori was escorting an HMAS Australian vessel to Espiritu Santo as Japanese forces were still active in the area and Allied forces were actively attempting to keep Guadalcanal and the Solomons secure after previous weeks of battle with the Japanese forces. The night was clear with every star in the sky. The wind was so low that you could hear gulls fishing off in the distance and the wakes splashing against the hulls of the ships. The air felt like Hawaii in spring and all you wanted to do was bask in the moon glow. Suddenly, voice radio communications from nearby Allied Island bases starting chirping away with information about visual confirmation of enemy subs in the area to the north. Soon after, all on deck order was given and everyone was forced to stand ready. A team was assigned light patrol and they began panning around looking for subs. Not more than two hours goes by with no visual contact made. They are finally given order to stand down and return to shut-eye duty. A few hours before daybreak, contacts from Nendo Island start coming on voice comms warning that potentials are flying around in the area just five miles south of Mori's escort position. Already worried that they may have been targeted by Japanese subs from their bow, they now have to contend with potential aerial assault and everyone is called to stand ready once more. Engines are killed, emergency lights activated and orders given to kill all lights. My grandfather, manning his light, is immediately ordered to put that candle out and pushes the searchlight straight down into the water, turning it off. When they finally stop moving, the crew can hear the low-tone humming of several planes passing parallel to their position. Everyone holds their breath and pretends to pretty much not exist hoping the enemy doesn't make visual contact with the ships. So for a good long 45 minutes, everyone just sits there, until they can no longer make audible contact with their enemy forces they hoped would pass. Finally, after almost two hours of nothing, they are given the go-ahead to start the engines and return to the passage. My grandfather flicks his cigarette port side and clicks on his searchlight, still pointing into the water. What he says he saw next aged him and the two others with him a good ten years. Below, where the searchlight sat focused in the water, lay an eyeball the size of a basketball. Sitting there, staring straight back at him from about ten feet underwater. The next three seconds lasted minutes in his mind as he watched this silvery disc of an eye look straight through him. Finally, the first of the engines started in what seemed like forever, and the beast that it was broke surface for a brief moment in order to dive deep. 
Even before people acknowledged giant squid existed, before they were ever caught on camera, my grandfather believed because he had seen one within 20 feet of his face. In my eight years of service, I had heard many stories of such things and even own a few teeth pulled from the rubber liner of a ship, but never had any such experiences myself. Adding that experience in lieu of the drama of war and you can get a sense for the true terror it would invoke. My grandfather, who passed away at 93 this July, told me this one growing up. Thanks to all that served and thanks for reading. This incident happened to me when I was a boy. My sister, myself, and my parents lived in a small trailer out in Connorsville, which is a little ways out from Bardo. My sister and I shared a room with a bunk bed, and there was always something kind of off about the room. There was one night when my mother came in while my sister and I had been asleep for probably three or four hours. She woke us both up and said, I don't know what it is, but you two need to come to sleep on the floor your dad and mine's room. There's just something not right. So we hated to. But we went in there and we fixed the bed on the floor and my mom. She went through the house and checked the locks and everything. And everything was fine. So we all laid down and I'd say an hour and a half later, there were sounds at the front door and we heard the front door open. My mom was up, I guess, and my dad and sister both were asleep. I was still awake, and we heard pitter-patter, almost sounded like children running in the house. This was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The way the trailer was set up, you had a door that connected to the hallway and to my parents' bedroom and one into the bathroom. So we heard these things run into the bathroom. You could hear them giggling, and then it was just the weirdest sound. It didn't sound like a usual childish giggle. My mom thought she had locked both of the doors that connected to the bathroom and to the hallway. Well, the door that connected to the hallway, it opened slowly, and this little short thing peeked its head through. Pardon my French, but it scared the hell out of me. It looked almost like it was wearing a hood on part of its head. It was probably about two and a half to three feet tall, and the face it was a... Uh... The only way I can describe it was it looked almost like a gargoyle. As far as the face, deformed like some of them can actually get, it was grotesque, and it just giggled, putting its hand on its mouth almost like, you know, I didn't mean to disturb you. It just stood there for a minute, and I'm about to have a panic attack. You know, sitting there, staring at that thing, I couldn't move. I felt like I was in shock. And my mom, she didn't move or say anything, you know. I didn't think she knew I was awake. And after a few minutes, it went back in the bathroom with the other ones and shut the door. They were in there to close to daylight. Then the door opened, and then they went right back outside. I didn't tell my mom what I saw until a couple of days later. I was just too afraid that if I did, they would just come back. And I told her, and she told me she saw the same exact thing. Dave asks about what prompted her to go in and get the kids. That night, she had like a feeling like God was telling her to get the kids, bring them in the bedroom, they don't need to be in there. She said that's the only way she can describe it. She said she was laying there asleep, and then she just woke up, and that feeling just hit her harder than a brick. It felt like it was trying to make its territory known. Basically, we can come and go anytime we want. It was playing mind games with us, my mom and myself. The feeling I got from it was that it was not good. It was evil. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.